So, welcome, Gita Vara. Um, hi. Hi. Medical, um, can we call you medical doctor of Ayurveda? No, practitioner is probably <laughs> the best way. <laughs> so, she comes from a background that uh, um, got into it through a family background before uh, a corporate life, and then I think back into Ayurveda uh, after uh, being fed up with a uh, working life, right? Correct, so, yeah. I, I, went, I went almost full circle, full yeah, circle full in tradition. Uh, published author with Ayurveda, the, her book on Ayurveda, uh, a bestseller. And um, without further ado, welcome Gita. And uh, can you just tell us how you got into Ayurveda? Because it's an interesting journey as to how you arrived back at Ayurveda. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well. Well. Thanks for thanks for having me on your um, feed, Adam. I really uh, appreciate uh, that. Um, I. So yes, I, I've been on my um, official journey of Ayurveda for. Um, 16 or so years. Um, so basically my, my journey, it, well, as crazy as it sounds, it was, it was actually kind of a calling and, um, it really did feel like a natural transition for me. Um, I certainly didn't go searching for it. And they say when the student is ready, the, the teacher appears, right. And this kind of yeah. feels exactly like that. Um, so, so in short, the story is, you know, I, I, ha I was working in the corporate world, um, in marketing, in, in um, IT and telcos. And um, I, I uh, kind of um, knew that my purpose in life was far greater mm. than doing what I was doing. Not that it was anything wrong with what I was doing. It yeah. was just I knew that there was, a, there was something greater. So this, uh, this all started to happen. Um, you know, these epiphanies started to happen, you know, at, at the infancy stages of my spiritual development. Mm. And so I, I ended up quitting my job. I went traveling and I landed up stateside um, to do a course in Ayurveda. And um, unbeknown to me, it just didn't feel right. And I felt, you know, this was the wrong thing for me to do. This wasn't the right course. So I questioned whether Ayurveda was a path for me. Right. But in, 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 in actuality, it was actually the course that was wrong. So I came back to London and... Um, I kind of felt um, a little bit disappointed, very upset because I'd left, you know, um, left everything to follow a path which didn't work yeah. out. But I did find a course in, in London right. with some incredible teachers and um, qualified in Ayurvedic medicine um, about 12 years ago and, and have been practicing since. And it's been a really um, incredible journey, you know, from, from start to where I am now and including publishing my book, um, uh, over the ancient wisdom for modern well-being so that that's been yeah it's been a really nice um journey to get to this point now how has that been received the book has it has it gone down well have you got, what kind of feedback have you had from it I mean, yeah it's a lot of books in the market how how would you say your um do you have a different take on it or is it a uh, 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 specifically uh, majoring on a specific point of ayurveda just before we get into yes. the new ayurveda well, well, it's, um, I, I wanted my, my, um, vision and mission really was to keep the book, um, authentic to the science of Ayurveda, but really update it so that we can learn how to apply it to our modern day lives. And I think Ayurveda is so vast. We can, um, just start by small rituals right through to, um, the medicinal, um, angle. So this really was an introductory book to people who want to learn about Ayurveda, how they can incorporate it. And I do delve a lot into digestive health, the doshas. There's a, it's packed with information, but I, I, I'd like to think it's a fairly easy read. <laughs> yeah. Well, given that people probably have a, you know, a kind of, we're, we're starting, I include myself in this, as a, to have a, an attention that's a, not much greater than a goldfish. Um, yes. We need to make sure that things are simple. Um, uh, look, and on that note, I think we need to backtrack us slightly and, and just see um, if we can understand a little bit about exactly what Ayurveda is and, and um, what it believes in. Let, let's contrast it maybe to the, as a, as a reference point, to the Western medical approach that maybe we're more familiar with. Uh, preventative mm. medicine, you know, allopathic medicine, and how does Ayurveda sure. differ from what we might know normally as medicine? Well, well, Ayurveda is well. Firstly, it's a five thousand year old science, so it's 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 a spiritual science, um, nevertheless. 
Where did it come from originally? Where the- it's, it's born from the Indian subcontinent. So at that time, it wasn't um, the divisions with Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, uh, you know, Sri Lanka wasn't really there. So it's, I, I say Indian subcontinent, really, because it's born of the Indus right. Valley. You know, it's, right. it's very sort of very yeah. old traditions. Right. Yeah. So it, it is a science. Um, there's a lot of philosophy. There's a lot of spirituality around it. But it's also um, a, a lifestyle. So it's, it's learning how we can live um, in alliance with our, or alignment with the, with nature. So what Ayurveda is really teaching us is moving away from this um, pill popping culture. So, you know, it's more about how we conduct ourselves, how we live um, to be um, the medicine for our, for our mind body. But, you know, naturally it's, it's a holistic science. So we're using um, herbs. We're really focusing on diet, our lifestyle, the laws and rhythms of nature, you know, realizing that, you know, sleep, exercise, food, our, are you know, they are the medicines. <clears throat> so Ayurveda is, is, is twofold really. It's both, you know, if, if somebody is having a health issue, then we can look at the curative aspect of it but yeah. the large part of what I look at especially especially in the book is a preventative angle so we don't you know it's a realization that we don't have to wait for a health issue to arise for us to address things because our body's constantly giving us signs and signals and it's identifying those early signs to make us realize that, okay these are imbalances yeah. let yeah. me let me work at correcting those you know I think that's one of our major problems is that we kind of assume health in, in the negative terms as, as a definition that, you know, health is something that we lose rather than working towards good health actively in our day. You know, we yeah. tend to kind of feel that we're only, we only talk about health when we're in bad health. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We, towards good health. As I understand yeah. it, Ayurveda talks a lot about the individual and, and suiting the medicine to the individual, whereas Mm-hmm. I think one of our difficulties with Western medicine is that we have a rather generalized system of treatment, right? Um, it doesn't take that much consideration that the individual might be variable, might be, mm. you know, might be the variable even. Um, how does Ayurveda, because I know a little bit about Ayurveda, I have to say, um, how does Ayurveda... Well, you're a Ayurveda, yogi, so you probably know more than yeah, you know. How does Ayurveda <laughs> uh, deal, deal with the individual? I mean, because I know there's... Yeah, well, well, well the... Yeah. The, the thing doshas. is, the doshas, yeah. yeah so so Ayurveda, in Ayurveda, we know there is no such thing as a, a one-size-fits-all approach, right? So we take a very personalized approach, and that's based around the dosha. So this, this medicine or this system is a person-centered system, not a yeah. disease-focused system. Um, and it's very much based on the patient-doctor relationship. But it, when we're looking at the person, we're looking at the imbalance of... Um, their dosha. So we we are born with a prakriti. This is like our blueprint. This is our fingerprint. This is who we are. So as a practitioner, I want to understand who you are based on your constitution, and yeah. your uh, then then what what we look at is the vikruti. Vikruti is where the where you are right now. Who you are right now. Where's the imbalances? So, so the we have to make an session. The, the, uh, was it prakriti and, and vikruti? But well, yeah, prakriti is your natural constitution. Yeah. And the Vikruti is your current state of being. So, so that where you are right now, so how far you've moved away from your right. natural state of balance. Okay. Right. And so that helps that as a practitioner. There wasn't, the Prakriti wasn't, that, it was balanced. When we came, we came. When we, we came come into balance. the world. Do we? Okay. Yes. That's yes. nice at least. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so we, we, we generally come in balance, but yeah. you know, like, you know, looking at us as an individual, this is really about, understanding how we adapt to the seasons, our environment, our relationships, our interactions um, in a work setting, um, you know, our rhythms during the day. So all of that is playing out and that can either um, imbalance us if we're doing the wrong things that the our prakriti doesn't um, adhere to, or it can keep us in balance. So we're constantly looking at flowing rather than being um having rigid diets or rigid rules it's much more about adapting to our environment adapting um ourselves within um and externally to to sort of move forward and flow with the rhythms of life i guess mm. so when you say the just to go again on, on the 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 essential balance that we come into the world with which is a nice um and comforting idea um <laughs> 
that we are all born in balance, you know, and we can go back. <laughs> well, we should be. Right. We should yeah. be, yeah. <laughs> Especially in these times. Um, so, and that, and, the, and the, the essential state of matter that we come in with, is that our dosha at the start? Do we have an inherent dosha? And can you explain what the doshas to the, to the uh, listenership is? are a little bit because they're very yes and, and people in, in yoga in the yoga world they often band around these ideas oh, i'm this dosha and that dosha and i kind of think that maybe we could do some clarification on the subtlety of the dosha yes um yeah so we we are we are we have a prakriti this is our natural state of being and through all the things that we face in life we become imbalanced so um the first thing we want to do is look at what the imbalances are and bring that back into, into um, alignment with our natural state. And so when we're looking at the doshas, you, you know, if anyone's heard of Ayurveda, they might have come across the three doshas, Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Mm. Now, these are our bioenergetic forces that sit um, within us that are the energies that drive everything that happens in our body. So Vata is the energy of movement. So any movement that's happening in the body is being driven by Vata. But Vata also has certain um, qualities about it. So it's, for example, you know, it's cold, light and dry. So those qualities is, is what we really look at when we're thinking about, I need to balance myself. So we pick up, all right, what are the qualities in the foods we're eating, the qualities in our lifestyle? Mm. Because then we know that if we're having more of the same, we're going to only increase that so then right. we can become imbalanced. Yeah. If we're using the opposites, because opposites will bring balance. So if we use opposites to cold, light and dry, which would be warm, sweet, hot, unctuous, kind of, um, you know, those yeah. sorts of opposite mm -hmm. qualities, then we can bring balance. So in a simplistic way, that's how, that's how we can navigate our way around bringing balance to ourselves when we understand our natural constitution. So then we've got the second... Um, Second uh, uh, dosha, which is pitta. Pitta is um, more the fiery one. So pitta is, you know, the energy of all the um, metabolism, digestion, movement, the chemical processes that happen in the body. So you could, you know, in a simplistic way, pitta would be seen as the food that we take in, for example, a process needs to happen in the digestion and mm -hmm. then it gets transformed. So that's the process of transformation in the body. Yeah. So pitta is hot, it's fiery, it's, it's liquid, it's very sharp by nature. So, you know, these doshas not only have qualities, um, they can't, they're born of the five elements, they also have certain characteristics, they display yeah. certain characteristics in each individual, okay. mentally, emotionally, physically. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the batter and just have a little, um, can, I mean, because this is fascinating for people and, and they, you know, love to kind of get an idea of one's type, you know. Can you give an, yes. example, of a can you give an example of a batter person? Um, yeah, when, so... And then, at what, and then the batter foods that maybe we're attracted to as a batter person, because the problem is that obviously we're attracted to what's not good for us, right? A batter will be attracted to batter stuff, right? Yes, yeah. That that see when vata's in uh, out of balance, vata people right. will you, usually go right. into their mind and right. the craving star or the, or right. the irregularity starts. So yeah, vata people generally they they sort of um, generally like physically they have a thin frame, maybe um, quite um, like a bony structure. Maybe their veins are visible. Um, they might have a sort of a, a, a sort of a crooked nose, or their bone structure is very prominent. They might have like dry skin or a tendency to kind of um, have dryness in in the body. So that might display as kind of gas, bloating, maybe get a little bit constipated uh, at times. So these are all sort of signs. But the people, you know, they're very creative, very enthusiastic. You know, the life and soul of the party, if you like, and you know, they just have this. Um, they're just, they're just sort of um, really vibrant. But, you know, if, if other people start to get out of balance, they might start to overanalyze. Um, they, they think they get anxious. They get stressed very easily. Um, their sleep patterns can get disturbed. Uh, you know, they might have irregularity in their eating patterns. So maybe sometimes they're really hungry. Sometimes they're not hungry. Their energies are in short bursts. So you get to see all of these types of characteristics, um, right. you know, with Vata. So when, you know, just looking at Vata alone, you know, we're a blend of con 
uh, blend of the dosha. So we're never one. Right. So that's okay. where the complexity start. But I don't know. Was, like um, that was literally an expose of, of my whole constitution. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you are so interested in Vata. Um, yeah, well, no, no, I'm not interested in the dosha generally, but um, yeah. it, did, it did feel like you were just talking about me. What, what kind of... <laughs> What kind of foods do that sort of, um, um, crave when they're out of balance? Just to just wow. to you know, the vision of myself. <laughs> yeah, well, they're good. they're going to crave, you know, the things that bring in balance. So they're going to have, you know, it's 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 in terms of food, it's the dry food. They want texture, the crunch, you know, they want all of those things. But actually, it's the complete opposite to what they need. So what they need is, you know hot foods, um, cook, well-cooked foods, unctuous foods, oily foods, you know, they need, you know, more than anything, you know, moving away from the food part, it's the regularity that Vata needs because Vata can fluctuate very, very quickly. So when Vata um, has a regular routine in their mm. eating patterns, sleeping patterns, they can immediately start to bring that little bit of balance back right. into their body and mind. So Vata needs to be grounded, it needs to be calmed, it needs to be soothed, it needs to be kept warm. So, you know, when we think about these types of things, I like to use these descriptive words because then we move away from lists of can and can'ts, do's and don'ts, you know. It's about being much more fluid, it's about being much more flexible. So we can start to say, right, these are the foods that feel right for me. And you, you, you learn about yourself and you follow your gut instinct, you follow your intuition, which will lead you, you follow your body's intelligence rather than the mind's craving, I guess. Right. How do so you that, balance then, how, as a Vata person? How, because I mean, Vata... You talked about but, the routine of it and then, and then change of diet. Um, what, what, else, what else can you do? With so, va- so, so, with, so with Vata, for example, um, you know, because the dominance, you know, the elements that are dominant for Vata is space and air. Right. So it's this, it's this rise of space and air that comes, if, comes up in, in the body and mind that creates this fluctuation. So that's where we get sort of a bit, like bit of an airhead, you know, or just fluctuation, just can't can't ground ourselves. Mm-hmm. So diet is definitely one aspect. Routine is the most important aspect. Um, but you know, through through meditation, through walks in the nature, you know, doing all those things that really bring being grounded. You know, keeping warm. Um, oleation is key for bringing vata into balance. So you know, really helping. Um, our body stay grounded through oils in in the diet, oils on the body. So this these these types of things. Oils on the body as well. That's important. Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Interesting. It just seems like it's a kind of it's not only a science of kind of eating or body. It's a science of the whole of life and lifestyle as well, isn't it? Really, it takes yes. all aspects of life. It seems. Yes, definitely, definitely. It's it's all it's all encompassing. So yeah, I've kind of distracted you with the. Uh would you like to say a bit about the, the pitta and the, um, the kapha? Yeah. 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 So we, 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 we spoke about, um, so, so pitta people, you know, if you have a, um, if you have pitta dominant in your, in your constitution, then maybe you're going to be sort of you're very goal, goal oriented, you're focused, you know, a, a real deep sense of passion, but pitta people will generally make great leaders, great speakers, you know, they're, they're very logical minded. So there's, there's a structure and strategy to everything that pitta that people do not not that it's a uh, it's a bad thing it's a good thing um but when when pitta gets out of balance they can become sort of um you know a little bit rigid overcritical um they might sort of um, be self-critical as much as everything else frustration anger all of those sort of emotions come up or they might tend to just really not fare too well in in the heat so they might really struggle with you know um, the weather, if it gets too hot, so excess mm-hmm. sweating. Um, so, so you can see that these heat elements um, kind of present themselves in in the mind and body when when things get out of balance. And then, kapha is the energy of stability and structure. It's sort of the because it's made of the water element and the earth element. Mm-hmm. It's the denser part of us. So it's it's what gives our muscle the mass. It, it's it's our physical um uh, physicality of the body so with kapha you know kapha is heavy it's cold dense you know these are the types of words we use to describe the energy of kapha 
And if kapha is dominant in your constitution, then what you might display, you know, you might have a sort of a broader body frame. Um, you, you, you might be stockier. Maybe you're going to have really like large, lustrous eyes, thick, lustrous hair. Right. You know, in, in character, you know, kapha people are like, you, you know, you want them, you want to cuff a best friend because they're the ones who are going to listen to you. They're just really calm and compassionate and just ooze love and nothing really bothers them. They're just really calm and loving. So really, really we're nice a, to have. We're a mix of all these doshas. We have, we have all, we have all of them. Of them. Yes. Is, yes. Is, is one be- dosha better than the other? No, no. <laughs> now that we don't want to, we don't want couple people to say, "Oh, Vata's better, so I need to be more Vata." No, it we, sounds like the Peter Dosha is the best. It's kind of well, a balance between Kappa and, and Vata. Yeah, and so we a have lot of people in the public eye are probably Pitta as well, right? A lot of people that we know and, and as well-known personalities. It sounds yes. like they'll probably be Pitta of Dosha, right? Or well, Pitta. not necessarily, because you've got the likes of you know Deepak Chopra and Oprah Winfrey, who are who are much more kapha, actually. Well, right, okay. Yeah, you, your Bill Gates and these type of people are more sort of um, Pitta. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then you. Pitta? Um, yeah, gosh, the Ace Ventura guy, Jim Jim Carrey. He would oh, really? be, yeah, right. he'd be he'd be a typical sort of um, um, and. Um, Oh god, I'm terrible with names, but the the lady from Sex and City, the oh, the main well, character. Those kind of things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so these people are, are sort of more about them. So we do have all the doshas in the body because without any one of them, we can't function. But when we when we were talking about prakriti, you know, our constitution, we are generally most of us are dual dosha. So we'll we'll have a dominance of two of them. Right. Some people will be strongly one. So you you are saying that you're identifying more strongly. With probably Vata, more, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not like Kappa, but I'm probably more Pitta than yeah. Pitta Some, and Vata, Pitta, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, and then we get the the, the rare few that are tridoshic. So there's there's a it's sort of a equal ish balance of 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 all three. But yeah, we we're trying to be the best version of who we are naturally. We're not trying to change our dosha or trying to be more of a dosha. We're just trying to be back to our natural balance of who we are. So that's the whole point of when we say, oh, I need to get, I need to be more balanced. Well, this is what balance means in Ayurveda. It's bringing balance back to your natural constitution. And that's going to be done through diet, lifestyle routines, you know, rituals, um, bedtime routines, you know, all of those things that we can adopt. How do the doshas um, kind of uh, play out in the outside world? Well, how do they manifest in the kind of outer reality outside us? Do they have a, a correlation in the, like material life outside the body? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, I mean, the doshas play a role in everything. So right. every, every food item you can take, you can understand certain characteristics. And when it comes to food, we understand it through um, the form of taste because taste, taste will influence an increase or decrease in dosha. So we can understand that. And that's where it starts to get a little bit more granular. But certainly everything has a dosha. So for example, you know, when we break up our year into our seasons, you know, each season is governed by a dosha. Yeah. So right now we're sort of at the tail end of spring or maybe we're in the middle of spring can never tell these days where we're at with our mm-hmm. seasons but um you know this is what we would consider the kapha time this is where our body wants to expel all the toxicity that builds up in the body that's been accumulated over the winter you know this is a time for cleansing and detoxing whereas in the winter which is much more of a vata season we wouldn't generally do those cleansing processes because it doesn't suit that time so that's why when we say being personalized you know personalizing your um, diet personalizing your lifestyle and ba- based on the doshas you know we can understand that this is also going to apply to nature so the seasons there's a vata pitta cough of time of day so certain activities are more suited to certain times of days even so this is a journey. It's about understanding who we are in relation to everything around us and understanding what works for us. Because sometimes we tr- it's, it's, it's very much square peg, round hole. We try and fit into 
certain stereotypes mm-hmm. or maybe our peers are doing something and we feel like we ought to be doing the same, but it doesn't really work for our body type. So it's honoring who we really are more than anything. That's, that's the key, isn't it? But that's the hardest thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we, that's where we've got well, to learn yeah, to, learn to listen kind of a, to. Understand your own in, in intuition and trust it, you know, is the million dollar question, I suppose, isn't it? So where does your role in this come in then for, for someone's, you know, as an Ayurvedic uh, doctor, practitioner, um, <laughs> however you, you want to be called, how, how do you kind of function in someone's journey and helping them, guide them? To kind of bring, because essentially what you're really trying to do is bring up their own natural intuition as to mm-hmm. guide them. Yeah, right? yeah it's absolutely. Moment, it sounds like every single moment there's a choice to be made, almost. Every everything is a choice. Everything's a decision. You can't be with a person that much, so you have to essentially rely on them to guide themselves, don't you? So yeah, how, how do you do that as a, as a therapist? Well, I see myself as a guide in in many ways, but you know, I'm I'm here to deliver and help people understand the principles of Ayurveda because the, the principles are not rules; they are guidelines to help us understand the rationale behind why we do things. And I think when you understand why we do certain things, and when we do them, it feels good. You don't need to convince anyone. You don't need to tell people to do it because they know naturally it's feeling right. So. I help people guide um, guide them on their journey, help them become a bit more empowered, actually, um, a bit more confident to listen to their own body because that's where the real answers lie within. Um, and I'm just here to facilitate that that journey. So, you know, depending on where they are in their journey, sometimes people come with um, some chronic health issues which we need to reverse Sometimes people are coming just because of curiosity and just to kind of dapple and bring balance. So it depends on where they are. And I'll, I'll, I'll start from wherever they're starting at and, you know, um, help them at a level that they're capable of um, right. taking on. Because you can bombard people with so much information, like we were discussing. Um, mm, yeah. You know, there's so much information, but what's relevant for me right now and what can I actually do right now? Can you use it alongside regular medicine? Yeah, I mean, I, I rather, you know, it's 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 a lifestyle um, essentially. So, you know, if um, if I'm suspecting anything, then I will send um, clients, patients to to get tests done. Um, but like Western medicine is great in an emergency, acute conditions for infections. But if you're having more sort of chronic lifestyle issues, then I don't feel that's the right place to start because we have have an innate imbalance within us. So um, I do encourage my clients to make the bigger changes in their habits so that they come up, can, can potentially come off medications if that's what they want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's about understanding like where your imbalances are. The thing is we've got to take responsibility. We can't just look externally for the answers or feel like something or someone is going to fix us. Mm-hmm. The you know the responsibility is about I understand something's not right with my body I'm ready and willing to make the changes that are necessary. It seems like that again is a really hard question. How do we have the strength when we don't feel like maybe we have and we don't feel well and you know we're not feeling good health to take that responsibility? Does Ayurveda help provide that strength to to kind of almost the, the kind of pre pre-strength necessary in order to get the strength, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's dependent on, yeah. In some ways, that 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 sort of boils down to the doctor-patient relationship. So there's got to be a trust. Yeah. that That's yeah. really important. That, you know, it's it's not about the medicine. It's about how the medicine's delivered. Yeah. And so I see, uh, that's what I see my role as, is, is to help somebody take one step and feel good. You know, when they feel the, feel good, um, realize the benefits of that change that they've made, yeah. then they're on board and they want to do a little bit more. So oh, oh. It, we can't run before we can walk. We just we just take small things. Sometimes it's just a matter of changing, you know, um, our rhythm of eating, you know. And, and one of those things that I often encourage people to do is, you know, listen to the body in terms of, are you feeling hungry? Because sometimes we are eating and we're not hungry. And this is one of the biggest causes of toxicity in our system because 
we are no longer listening to the body. We think, well, it's lunchtime, it's, it's, it's breakfast time, it's dinner time. And we yeah. just eat categorically out of I routine. I think your times are just play sparkers now, aren't they? You just eat according to a clock rather than eat according to the body. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really so many meals as well, really. You know, probably yeah. a lot, not too much overeating is, is a lot of the trouble. Yeah, do you, do you tend to have three meals a day, Adam? Or I probably have one meal a day, really. One meal. That's the yogi. That's the yogi way. What time yeah. are you having that meal? Uh depends. Yeah, it's, to be honest, I work best on an empty stomach. So if I'm busy during the day, then I don't really remember it that much, you know. But probably as yes. a more balanced person, I probably should amend that. Really, um, <laughs> yeah. I, feel, I feel like I'm, I'm I'm in the analyst chair now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you know, it, it's, it's just you're working with your body. I think you're very in tune with what's going on. So, I'd like, I'd like to think so. I don't know. Mm. No, that's always the case, but you keep trying. I suppose it's a constant journey, as you said. There's no, you know, I think don't think health is a conclusion. It's just a constant the process, and sometimes you do better at it, and sometimes you do worse at it, right? Because it kind of reflects how you feel about everything. Really, you're you're in a state and you're out of state, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It is the absolutely. issue. Yeah. Um, I had a question I was going to ask there. Oh, about, yeah, like how a treatment would actually look. You know, someone comes in like me and they're complaining, say, of, oh, like I can call it, I can often say I might feel a little bit agitated, a little bit unclear. I'm very vibrant. I've got a lot of ideas, but I find it hard to centre those ideas sometimes mm-hmm. and be logical um, and be calm and centred. Um, for example, um, how would you go about instilling a, a you know a greater sense of groundedness in me um yeah so so firstly you know we we would go we talk a lot more in detail about your diet and lifestyle so i can understand what your rhythms look like and what your routine looks like um and and the type of diet that you have and and then i'll marry that or you know check check across and see where your issues are and so when when vata gets out of balance you know it really does boil down to being more grounded so perhaps it's about you know maybe for you it might be the case of having more than one meal a day potentially you know in terms of feeling grounded um it might be the case of you know doing more more breath work again to stay grounded being out more in nature maybe taking a bit more rest. Um, so it just depends on um, what you come in with, with your presenting complaints and actually what it is that I can see as the triggers that are causing that. So the first step would be to identify the trigger points and understand what's causing you to feel that way. Um, it could be as simple as somebody's just not sleeping well, or the quality of sleep is so poor right. that it's it's having an impact on the entire day now, and yeah. and everything is out of sync as a result of that one thing. So then we want to look at the root cause and understand. Um, so the root cause, yeah. identifying the root cause, is super important. Kind of a, a sense of a detective finding out exactly, you know, mm-hmm. what's going on in the whole of life, right? And any kind of you know, find the one trigger that you never would have even considered that it was something, you know, to do with maybe taking a yeah. diet that didn't suit you, you didn't even realise, right? Yeah. But it's not just physical as well, Adam. You'd be surprised right. at the number of clients who come um, to me just for the sort of the, the physical aspect of their being. But, you know, my job is to delve deeper because mm-hmm. in some ways I, I, I get to a point where I can start reading people and I know that they are being triggered by something that's much more emotionally driven and you know quite often clients you know might just let out all this emotion in the session and they feel so much better just because they've identified the root cause or we've identified Mm -hmm. why they are having all these digestive problems because they might have had some trauma that in their life or you know something's happened in their emotional body that is correlating so it, it can get super complex. That's why we spend so much time. It's not a, you know, five, 10 minute in and out, here's your medicines, mm-hmm. off you go. We want to really establish what these root causes are and understand like on an energy level, what's going on as much as the physical, uh, mental and emotional. Do you actually give any pills? At the end of the um, if they're necessary, yes. Like if, if we want to do a cleanse, for example, then might, might have... Do you, will you give me some Ayurvedic pills for Vata? 
There's no Ayurvedic pills for Vata. No. 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 They're, 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 all my wives and yeah. Can I take a few pills? They wouldn't. I mean, there are there are herbs that are there to be used right. to bring they're balance, right. but um, there's no pill for Vata or pill for Pitta, you know, to cure all the ails. This is, this is about um, looking at... Um, all of the modalities um, yeah. in unison to to bring that harmony. But yes, herbs are definitely there, very much a part of okay. um, Ayurveda. Okay. So capsules, tinctures, um, um, decoctions, jams, you know, we have a whole range of medicines, all the natural. The Ayurvedic jams, yeah. How does it, yeah, yeah I do, I remember seeing, how, do, how does a jam become Ayurvedic? Well, it's not jam as in like boil down sugar with some fruits. You know, this yeah. is this, these are medicinal. Um, it's got these herbs. Are av- avalehias, yeah, they're, they're herbal jams. Okay. Um, so, so they're there because see, see, we could bombard our body, and this is the thing with um, vitamins and minerals. Sometimes we bombard our body with all these good stuff, but firstly, are we digesting and absorbing it? So in Ayurveda, digestion and absorption is far more important sometimes than what's actually being taken. So you could put in really healthy foods, but still not digest it. Or, you know, you could break down and digest some unhealthy foods if the digestion is strong. So Ayurveda really believes that the carrier, so water can be a carrier for the herbs um, because some um, nutrients are water soluble, some nutrients are... Um, lipid soluble so we need to have those carriers so we've got to have water we've got to have oils and you know things like herbal jams and all of these um, different ayurvedic preparations are there because they act as a carrier or there's a synergy in the way in which they're prepared so you you could say like ashwagandha for example Mm -hmm. you know is a very grounding herb to help with the sleep and vata so for example ashwagandha you know we could take it in a capsule form but maybe you're not taking at the right time of day maybe you need maybe you need to take it with something to help it absorb better so those are the kind of intricacies that we deal with as a practitioner so do you can you do it on that note can you do it on your own or do you really need to go see i mean it seems like you're so subtle you really need to go and see a specialist if you really want to work with it yeah, I, I think I think it's a nice introduction just to start playing around with understanding your dosha and you know dappling. But if you do want to um, really delve deep, I, I think you know working with a practitioner really is the answer. And it doesn't have to be like you have to spend lots of money and have regular sessions. You know, I, I always say if you're not having any serious health issues, then once a season is good enough because you get to understand how your constitution, your body works in the different seasons. And then it's a journey. Then you just adapt and adjust and you take on more as and when you feel ready. Mm-hmm. Well, but definitely work with a practitioner. It's, it's, it's the best way. It's, you know, you're going to source of the knowledge. Is there any general, I mean, I know people that are listening want to kind of know, is there any general kind of guidelines? Cause I think in the, you know, in the kind of popular mind, Ayurveda is often uh, kind of defined by great use of dairy products and, you know, all the milks and the ghees and the stuff. Like that. <laughs> I think that's what kind of people are kind of, you know, sometimes a little bit prejudiced in the modern times when we're told not to have too much dairy, you know. how it, Can you just do something to, to kind of uh, balance this, this viewpoint and maybe just if, it, if there is such thing as a basic uh, Ayurveda diet, uh, would you would you say would you kind of give a uh, an idea about what that is? Yeah, so in Ayurveda, um, I think firstly diversity is key. So sometimes we are so preoccupied with having restrictive diets. Ayurveda is not about being restrictive; it's about being diverse. What is important is how food is processed. So um, it's not so much about it is about what you're eating. I'm not saying it isn't, but it's about how you're eating it, when you're eating it, eating very consciously. That plays a huge role, but also um, bringing balance for your dosha. So it, for example, you know, we'll, we'll stick with the vata here. So when we say, oh, you know, you need to eat a more grounding diet. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, well mm. root vegetables, root vegetables are grounding, right? right? So because they are grown underground, you know, they, they you know, they, so there's a process that happens, you know, eating the root vegetables. Vatha doesn't do well with cold or raw food. So, you know, cooking those foods, you know. So every step, there's a process that happens. Um, 
So there isn't a one size fits all. It's just understanding because people will have um, intolerances come up and, you know, then we get onto the whole gut health issue. But, you know, timing yeah. of meals. I think I'd like to go to the and talk about the digestion a bit more in a minute. But I suppose I was casting around to this idea in the yoga that we hear of this idea in the yoga of the sattvic diet, you know, mm -hmm. that of this diet is sattvic or that food is sattvic. What does that really mean? Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, to, for our body to function super well, optimally, our mind to be really clear, you know, this, a sattvic diet can, can really help. Sattvic foods are pure foods, you know, these are foods that have high prana, these are foods that are um, full of energy, they, they are, are good for the body. So all natural foods, you know, it's not difficult to have a sattvic diet, it's, it's really what we're talking about is natural foods you know and then if we're looking at the mind qualities you've got um rajasic foods and tamasic foods you know when it comes to the mind qualities the so tamasic foods are lifeless foods basically you know foods that are processed and mm. um pre pre-prepared and you know they just don't have any life force energy no prana mm. Mm. so these are the foods that we wouldn't want and then we've got the rajasic foods you know meats and onions and garlics and spice and Right. So we need an element of that, but we don't need a lot of it. And so the sat -sat foods are kind of stimulating, right? It's more stimulating. Yeah, more stimulating. So <laughs> depending, <laughs> like, if you're a... You, the meat couldn't be sattvic, for example. Meat would not be sattvic, right. no. Right. No, no. That yeah. would be much more rajasic, or if it's overcooked and left for days, that, then it becomes tamasic. Uh, so... Are you vegetarian always, or to some eat meat? Well, the thing is, there is, um, it's, it's a personal choice, first of all. So some will, some won't. Um, it depends, you know, meat is, is, again, it's one of those things which is a personal choice. So sometimes it will work for your body, sometimes it won't. So we wouldn't recommend meats. Like I never recommend meats in the evening, for example, not for any other reason than the fact that it just doesn't digest very well at that time. Okay. So that's what I advise um, a lot of my clients. Um, but it depends. So if you do eat meat and you're having certain health issues, then maybe we need to address that. If you're really debilitated and you're really weak and you're constantly sick, then maybe we need to address, do we need to bring some dairy items like ghee and milk into the diet or meat soups and things into the diet to help balance? So meat is um, anything is medicinal if it's used in the right way. So there's no, no, there's no judgment when it comes to meat because traditional Ayurvedic texts right. have, have stated use of certain animal products really? for medicinal purposes. Well, yeah. The idea of ahimsa, you know, the non-harm. And I mean, obviously that's big in the yoga, you know, in the idea of yoga. Yeah. Yeah. So you wouldn't, it wouldn't be, yeah. it, it wouldn't be seen as dietary it's seen as medicinal. It's a very, very clear uh, difference. So if someone is um, having um, some kind of illness and their, rem their, their medicine is the product of um, some animal, um, then first you look for the, uh, the best oh. alternative. But if that's the only solution, then we can resort to that. But, but it's, it's medicinal, it's not yeah. dietary. Well, so it, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> How, I mean, can you give a little bit of background, maybe just to kind of break this up a little bit on, on, the, on the personal, like on how you came to it and if, if you've had any difficulties that you've used Ayurveda to, to overcome, it's always helpful to kind of get a little bit of a personal feel as to getting yeah. the, the whole subject. Yeah. Theoretic, because we've become very theoretical. I think, it, you know, we we'll to bring it back down to... How, yeah, how I've applied it. I mean, yeah, for me, so so I grew up um, in, in a very much Indian household, you know, with my grandparents uh, included there. And they, they were very ritualistic in their in their way, um, in their day. So I, I grew up, you know, with, with a lot of rituals that were Ayurvedic, but didn't realize at that time. So, wow. you know, things, you know, simple things like, you know, using a tongue scraper, which now it's like, I'm all, I, this is my single most, if anyone wants something that they want to take on as an Ayurvedic ritual, it's tongue scraping, because really? this is something I've done every day without fail, like did, always. Did you, did you grow up in London or was that? I grew up in London. Yeah, oh, it seems so strange, like it's so so kind of like exotic, and you know, 
You're using a tongue yeah. in London. Right? Yeah, since yeah. yeah, since I was five years old. So, um, or probably happened. younger even. Right. So you know, it, 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 some of those rituals have have stuck, and and I appreciate it so much more because now I understand the sort of um, the medicinal value or the the balancing value of it. Um, and you know, even things like um, you know, eating around the table with a family, complete meal, having yeah. uh, having having um, prayers and gratitude for the food. So so though all of those rituals were stipulated in in, in my upbringing and. You know, it's sort of grown from there. So I, th- I think you know, I went through that rebellious phase in my early, late teens and early twenties. You know, there's, there was this dichotomy of living in a Western world but having a very Eastern culture in in the home, and so you know, trying to sort of fit in in two different worlds was was a real challenge for me. So so I went through the whole phase of rejecting you know a lot of my um, mm. cultural um, aspects of who I was because just to fit in. But then right. as I grew, grew out of that and I, I, I came back full circle, back to Ayurveda and, and really appreciate that my heritage is so rich in wisdom and so ingrained. And, and now I'm, you know, as a practitioner, I not only help clients, but I wouldn't say I'm, I practice everything that I preach, but a lot of it I do. So, you know, I, I, um, I do my periodic cleansing and I can really notice a difference in my energy levels, you know. Um, understanding in, like in your rebellious years, did you stop using the tongue scraper? No, <laughs> I have. I'm sorry, I couldn't concentrate exactly after the tongue. What's the, what is the benefit of scraping your tongue? Oh, there's so many. Well, first, firstly, you know, as, as we're sleeping, we accumulate all these metabolic toxins, so our, our body um, is releasing all these toxins that's the whole point of sleeping because we need to get rid of those toxins so when we wake up in the morning you know those toxins will accumulate either we need to eliminate through our bowels but a lot of toxins reside in the oral cavity so you know you know i i encourage everyone who's listening today to to take a look at their tongue in the morning now if you see a white coating you've got digestive toxins so everyone has some mm. but um, the more you have, the more toxicity you have in the system. So the tongue scraper is designed to remove those toxins. They come onto the tongue. You can just remove mm-hmm. them completely by just scraping them off the tongue. Absolutely. Yeah. I kind of remember when I was just first uh, a student in London, and I, I got friendly um, with a lot of uh, with a lot of Indian um, people in, uh, up in North London, and I used to go mm-hmm. stay. Sometimes and they have a whole bunch of rituals, like you said, at the start of the morning that they did. Like, um, first, I was told you always should brush your teeth to get rid of the toxicity in the mouth in the morning. I, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you should do brush your teeth in the morning um, as if it comes into the mouth. Is that it? Is that the yeah, br- br- brushing, um, brushing, then um, tongue scraping, then oil pulling, and you know, you could, you know, as a yogi, you would have done, you know, all the the and the and the. And the okay. I've done a little bit of this, but you know, yeah. <laughs> just playing increment to uh, to flush it out of you a little bit, as it were. <laughs> well, yeah, can you say a bit about the oil pulling. Yeah, again, the oil pulling, um, you know, it's designed to remove the more finite impurities in the in, in the mouth. So that's really useful. So we'd use like a, a warm, either sesame oil or a coconut oil. Um, but, you know, like the tongue scraping and oil pulling, these, these small like oral cleansing rituals are there because it protects the mouth because our, our gums are super absorbent. There's a lot of bacteria in, in the mouth itself the first place where we expose ourselves to the external world, you know, when it comes to food. So we have to take care of that. But yeah, it's removing the impurities and the tongue scraping is is also removing um, not only toxins, but enlivening the taste buds. And everything in Ayurveda, when it comes to food, does revolve around taste. So this is really important. Taste is... I, I'm kind of stumped there. How does it revolve around everything revolves around taste? So yeah, yeah. Because see, when we when we were talking about the doshas and we were talking about bringing balance, and how do we know what kind of foods we should eat to bring us balance? So yes, we can look at the qualities. So we use the example of um, root vegetables being grounding in nature. Well, taste plays. Sorry, taste plays a role as well. So with taste, you know, for example, the sweet, sour and salty tastes 
will bring balance to vata, okay? The sweet and bitter taste. Literally just the taste balances the whole yeah. body. It, it's one aspect of it. When it comes to food, the, the, the taste balance of the sweet taste will bring balance to vata. But if, if say, you're more of a kapha body type, then the sweet taste will bring imbalance. So that's, that's where we start to know what we should eat based on taste balance. And the reason is because every taste has, a, has an action in the body. Right, so the sweet taste is nourishing for the body tissue. So the vata body, remember, is very can be very like um, small framed, skinny, you know, thin, bony. So they need more nourishment, you know, for the body to bring balance. So mm-hmm. the sweet taste can can do that. Whereas the kapha type might need more um, bitter and pungent taste because they right. already have a, an abundance of of flesh. So they need the opposite. So so that's how we work with taste. It has, and every taste plays a role. So every like. Bitter taste is detoxifying for the body, for example. So that's how we use taste, the, the knowledge of taste in Ayurveda. Oh, it's incredibly subtle, isn't it? Mm, very fascinating how, science. How, it's often said, I think, that, that Ayurveda and yoga are like two um, brother and sister. And that, I mean, uh, I think of Richard uh, Forley, is that, is that his name? Um, mm. Forley, um, who was famous for talking about Ayurveda and yoga. He says that one can't be practiced without the other. How would you say that's true? What's the relationship of Ayurveda to yoga? If there's, uh, well, I know there'll be a lot of yoga practitioners out there listening. So, mm-hmm. how would you, uh, how would you, how could we relate Ayurveda in our, in our yoga to our yoga practice even or, or general day? Well, yeah, I mean, they're both, they are sister sciences, as you say, um, and they do share lots of similar principles. But, you know, as a yogi, they'll be a little bit more um, regimen. So they'll be like a more of a stricter routine because you are following a yogic path. Whereas Ayurveda can, you know, we can cast the net a little bit further out. You know, it, it can be applied um, for the layman or the person who isn't a yogi as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that in order to follow Ayurveda, you have to be a yogi. But if you're a yogi, you definitely want to start thinking about the Ayurvedic principles because it only supports that journey. Right. So um, there is that, that, that aspect. But there's so, much, um, there's so much correlation, as you were saying, about you know, having a sattvic diet and following routines. And you know, the overlap comes where we're looking at breathing and meditation. You know, so there's a lot of overlap um, in, in those aspects. So, you know, I, you know, yoga is not only what takes place on the mat, I guess. And so our daily rituals and you mentioned ahimsa and understanding all those aspects of um, social conduct, moral conduct, who we are, you know, how, what is our dharma, all of those aspects definitely overlap between Ayurveda and yoga. Mm, mm. Um, what about physical practice? I mean, I've heard it said before, I'm too rajastic for uh, Ashtanga yoga, which is obviously what we're most of us probably practicing. Um, you know, I ought to do a more steady karma practice uh, to balance my dosha. What, what do you think about this mentality that we need to suit our practice to our uh, dosha? Or can we use any practice if we use it more? I'm not trying to wait. Yeah. Way. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, it's it, well, it, well, it's yeah, well, it's absolutely true. So in Ayurveda, we would definitely say, you know, and this is not just about yoga; it's about movement in general. So with a vata type, we wouldn't want to necessarily, you know, if they're having an imbalance, mm. then we I would definitely be saying, you know, you're probably having too much activity at this point. Um, and so we wouldn't want to do Ashtanga, the Vinyasa, you know, all of that, you know, the hot yoga, you know, none of that. We would want to do more sort of gentle yin, hatha. So yes, we can balance our practice according to our, our dominance in the dosha for sure. Um, but I do see this. I, I see like people coming in with a lot of pitta issues, for example. And the, and, and when I, when we start talking about their yoga practice or their movement, they are going to be the ones who are going to be doing that hot yoga and vinyasa yeah. and really strong yoga. That's so a it's a balance. It's a balancing act. Yeah. I just kind of feel like sometimes maybe avoiding the issue doesn't solve it, you know, maybe again <laughs> it's a balancing yeah, act yeah sure. we are dependent of, of it but maybe it's just a question of how we do it yeah so you know if if, if you enjoy <laughs> the, the ashtanga yeah, like because i mean yeah. in the 
in in the I mean I've kind of answered the question for you, but maybe in the doing, you know, there's a you know in the in we can uh, we can look at ourselves and our, our approach towards it rather than well, like you know, I'm a pitter person, therefore I need to do a very cooling practice. It kind yeah. of sidesteps the whole of our approach in the first place. The difficulty with our attitude, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's about balancing, and I I, I think it, it doesn't mean. So, so that's the thing, you know, when you understand what your constitution is, it doesn't mean it becomes rigid that I can do this and I can't do this. Right. It's about knowing that, okay, well, I am displaying and experiencing experiencing um, signs of aggravated pitta or really increased pitta. So in that in- instant, I would be saying, yes, you need to really calm that down. But it's about having, you know, having your yoga practice that you enjoy but also having the the you know things that counterbalance that so there's a balance of doing the things that are um that you enjoy that might be um aggravating your pitta but you're you're bringing in a balance by doing other things so there's never going to be like oh i i like for you if you know if someone like you practices ashtanga but your pitta constitution doesn't mean you have to stop your practice Mm -hmm. it just means you have this awareness now that you might do uh, might do it three times a week rather than seven times a week, you know. And then you 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 bring in other right. practices to bring in balance. For yeah. example, you know, it's 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 about bringing in the balance. That's the main yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and along those lines, maybe finally, like let's let's talk about the current um, times. And uh, obviously, there's a lot more stress in this these times and uncertainty. Um, a lot more um, anxiety is coming up for people. I think. Um, do you have any ideas or tips as to how we can just be a bit calmer or help ourselves to be feel at least a bit less fearful and anxious? Yeah, I think you know the the key thing is this is this is when Vata gets aggravated. You know, when the fear and anxiety kicks in, or when we're feeling stressed, that's when when we can say you know Vata is is aggravated. So again, we want to use the opportunity right now to um, connect with nature, so sort of be with nature. Um, this is really important. Making sure that we get a good night's sleep. This is this this is this is a pillar of health in Ayurveda, you know, getting the right amount of sleep. Not the right amount, the right quality of sleep. But what if you're having struggling with sleep? Is there anything you can take or yeah, you can take like- um yeah, so you can you can give yourself a foot massage. Um, you know, we sometimes it's not about what we can do; it's about what we need to undo. Um, so sometimes it's you know sometimes people say I'm not sleeping, but then are you watching things that are stimulating and being right. adjusting for your mind yeah. at that time? So mm. sometimes it's more about the undoing, and right. then um, and then we can in, include you know gentle music or foot massage, have a hot milky drink with some with some spices. And, and so you right. can do, you know, can have a little bit of a ritual around that. And then if someone's really struggling, then of course we've got treatments like Shiradhara, head massage. Nasi, there are treatments there. There are herbs there. It depends. You know, first we start with, let's make the changes to your routine and rituals. Then we can introduce um, the herbs and treatments if, if they're needed. Right. Mm. I think so, yeah. Issues for people, isn't it? And the other one I didn't touch on that I just kind of briefly, I know you're very interested in and you you, uh, brought it up is the digestion. And um, Mm -hmm. so many people are suffering with difficult digestion. Is there any basic ideas that we can uh, we can employ uh, kind of employ in our daily lives to to help around uh, digestive issues? Uh, Very basic, yeah, yeah. So, on a really basic level, I would the, the, the key takeaway um today apart from tongue scraping which is part of the whole digestive um, ecosystem very important part i might add is really like asking yourself are you hungry really simple question are you hungry because you know if we're feeling hungry we can eat if we're not feeling hungry don't eat so if you're not feeling hungry for breakfast for example sorry we just want to eat if you want to eat well there's a difference back no but I really need to take something now just to kind of, you know, comfort myself or, you know, like I'm bored or, you know, I'm feeling anxious, uh, you know, or how do we do that? <laughs> so then, th- then, we're, then we're coming very much from the mind, you know, the mind is an organ that gets in the way sometimes, but it, it, it's listening to the body. The reason why it's so important to really listen to whether you're feeling hungry is because this is our digestive system saying, my fire is ready to break down the food. 
So the mind is not going to have the agni to break down that food that's going in the stomach. So the, so the, the agni is the fire in, in the digestive system, correct? Yeah. So if we ask ourselves, am I hungry? Then we know that we're eating and our body can digest it and break it down. And sometimes that's it, sometimes it's as simple as that. You know, people are eating uh, a heavy breakfast because they've been told breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And then um, what happens is they can't digest it. And then they get into all sorts of like cramping or gas and bloating. So sometimes it's about, you know, just listening to your hunger and, and eating accordingly. Mm. So that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway, really. Yeah, not always easy to, to uh, employ or put into practice, right? Mm, um, absolutely. Okay, you're on a lighter note. Let me know a little bit more about you. What, I always do a little fun uh, extra round. <laughs> What's your, I mean, you, you seem very holy. What's your favorite treat or guilty pleasure? Do well, you have, or are you, yeah, I have many, oh, but my, um, <laughs> I guess, I guess for me, you know, and one, one, firstly, I love my dark chocolate. So I will, that's something I will never give up. So, and it's actually good for you, for your brain. So I will have dark chocolate and I do, I do enjoy a glass of wine. So, you know, yeah, it's in actual fact in Ayurveda, it said that a glass of wine is fine with food. And it's better than having a, yeah, it's better than having a, a, a sort of a pint sized glass of cold water. Better, a glass of wine is better than cold. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah also, it is. Um, Ayurvedic cigarettes at one point. Yeah. There are, there are, yeah, yeah. I like some of that as well. Yeah, they're just, they're just, they're just herbal preparations. Yeah, they're, herbal. they're herbal preparations. Yeah. And um, yeah. who, who is your greatest inspiration? Do you have a? Mm. Sorry, I don't have to think about too much. There's many inspiring things. It doesn't have to be. A yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, um, I mean, there are so many, so many people inspire me for so many different reasons, really. But I think for me, it's, it's so much more about um, what they inspire me in terms of how they invoke growth in me. So that's why I, I say it's so many people. So if, um, you know, if someone instills some quality in me that invokes my growth by their actions that's that's what I find inspiring so and that's going to come from so many people even you know even down to my niece and nephew you know so right. you know I think children can be really inspiring actually they, they bring this vibrancy and innocence that we need to relearn as adults <laughs> so yeah so many people so mm. many inspirations <laughs> And finally, how do you relax? I, I, I love, I really love to indulge in, uh, you know, long walks and um, you're on, on your social media. sound healing baths and uh, yeah, shower. Like for me, stress straight in the shower, just kind of wash, wash all those stresses away. Hot shower. Yeah. Salt water baths, that kind of thing. Massages. A glass of wine and a bath. Yeah, perfect combination. <laughs> well, I really appreciate talking to you today, Gita. Um, it's been wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much for coming, and, and I hope that um, people have a slightly better idea of a very subtle and complicated science in Ayurveda. Um, if you're interested in learning more uh, and you want to talk more to Gita or maybe read something, is there somewhere where they can find you, Gita? Yeah, so my my book is available on Amazon, of course. So it doesn't take you. Uh, much uh, to find it. It's just Ayurveda and my name, and my name's spelled G double E T A, Vara spelled V A R A. Um, but if anybody wants to sort of do a deeper dive into Ayurveda, you can find me at my website, which is gitavara.co.uk, and, and just, just contact me through that and, and be happy to hear from you. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. It's been <laughs> wonderful talking with you, Adam. I have to speak to you soon. Bye for now. Take care. Bye.